All right, it's Wednesday night, and Pastors Chris and Melissa, they are on a well-deserved break in California. Pastor Chris spoke at a men's conference there last, this past weekend, and they stayed for a couple of days to rest. Well-deserved, and he's also preparing the message for Sunday. He's preaching back here on Sunday, and we are starting a new series, a series that is a, 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 a welcome back series from last summer. We call it Turn It Loose and it's a series that is actually about that there is no series at all. But God will speak and give a word to Pastor Chris or whoever is preaching that weekend that will be a right now word for that time, that weekend. So come, be excited. Uh, Pastor Chris is back this Sunday, going to give us the first, uh, the first message in this summer series, Turn It Loose lose all right and also sunday night at 6 p.m we have awakening prayer night here at reach and it's 6 p.m we come together to pray uh, both the teenagers we have riot prayer and all adults and everything in between right we will gather here at 6 p.m on sunday night so welcome and come and pray with your church family we're going to pray for our city we're going to pray for probably our technology right and we're going to pray for you and for me and we're going to pray for one another and believe God to move in our church amen but tonight we are continuing the current series we are in here on Wednesday nights uh, that is God's promises and this is week six now that we are talking about the promises of God and as Pastor Chris so, so gently has explained and preached to us it would take forever to cover all the promises that God has given us if we would take them out one by one we will stay in this series until Jesus comes back because the Bible is packed with promises of God all right but there are promises for you. There is a promise. Uh, listen to me now, church. There's a promise into your current situation. A promise that will practically deal with your practical situation. What you and I have to learn to do is to read the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit as we are reading to speak to us and reveal to us His promises okay so when we do that God will speak God will show promises or if you've been around or if you listen to the podcast you will see that there are many promises that we've been talking about but now maybe they are speaking to your current situation so let's be fair now to, to receive a promise is one thing but to trust that promise we need to know something about the one who gave the promise to you just because you receive a promise doesn't mean that it would add automatically be fulfilled in your life okay let me give an example if someone sends you an email telling you that you sir has been been chosen to receive 214 million dollars from this random person in Nigeria all you have to do to receive those 240 million dollars well for some reason you need to put in ten thousand dollars for that process to start so that you I don't know what they can't use the 240 million dollars to start the process you know what I'm saying so if you received an email like that, similar like that, it's not true. It doesn't matter if they say, well, we promise that. We promise. Just transfer your 10000 We promise we give you the 240. And don't believe it. It's not going to happen, right? So a promise per se doesn't mean that it will happen. You see, you know, if you receive a promise from someone that never ever keeps his word, but always have an explanation or an excuse why he could not fulfill that promise. Next time you receive a promise from the same person, you will not believe it. Are you following what I'm saying? All right. I don't know how many of your parents and you heard about daddy, you promised. Is that just me? Daddy, you promised. And I'm like, dang, I did, right? So listen to me now. If you promise your kids, if your kids are telling you, mommy, you promised, daddy, you promised, you better keep that promise. 
You better learn to not give as many promises or always keep them because they will look to you and you have a chance to raise up your children knowing what a word is worth that if you say something it will actually be fulfilled. You can learn to teach them to be people, men and women of their words, right? So you either have to keep ever, you better keep that promise. Daddy, you promised. Did I? I guess I did. All right. Then it cost me what it will cost me. But I will keep my promise because I'm teaching you to be a man or a woman of your word. Right. Are you following what I'm saying? Because then if they will trust, if they will become, if you are, or if you meet someone that is a person that will keep, always keep their word. They're always in every situation kept their word and they have the means to fulfill the promise. You can bank on it. If you receive a promise from them. And now we have a God that says this in Psalm 89 in verse 33 and 34. Listen, but I, God says, I will never stop loving him. Never, never stop loving him. Nor fail to keep my promise to him. No, I will not break my covenant. I will not take back a single word I said tonight church i want to talk about the foundation to the promises not just one or two or five promises tonight but i want to tell you about the foundation we have for god's promises that is the covenant we have with god god is saying he will not fail a single promise he made he can't because he cannot break the covenant that he made with us Listen, a covenant in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, was something extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. It's an unbreakable relationship, stronger and more powerful than anything else so let's look to the bible now and find people in 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 covenants and we will see what the foundation looks like we're going to start with a man called abraham and abraham received two promises from god and those promises were not just well i'm going to give you you know a, a five thousand dollars or i mean that would be amazing but he's giving him impossible promises to be fulfilled the first one God says well I know you're very old Abraham and I know your wife is old but I promise you you will have a son you will have an heir from your own body and you from yours and Sarah's relationship that's impossible I know but I promise you and then secondly you might be a foreigner in this land right now you might not be a landowner anywhere but look around you I will give you this entire land everything will belong to you one day now you and I we can look in the Bible and we can find faith in the word of God and see how faithful God has been throughout the Bible that he has never ever ever taken back a word but he keeps his promises but Abram he didn't have a Bible he had nothing to be honest Abram had a voice speaking to him right he didn't have anything else and this voice said I'm God and Abraham had to trust this voice so when Abraham received the two promises this is what he says in Genesis 15 and 8 but Abraham said sovereign Lord how can I know that I will gain possession of this land how can I know that I will be a father. How can I know God? I know it's written in your word. God, I know you've said it. I've, I've, I've seen it there in the Bible. I've heard my life group leader talk about it. I, I've heard my pastor preach about it. I know what you said and I would really need this promise to be fulfilled in my life right now. But how can I know? that it will be fulfilled I don't know about you but I can identify with Abram in that situation many times how can I know 
I, I see God, I understand it, but I cannot know. Now, if you finish reading chapter 15 in Genesis, you will see that God answers Abraham with a powerful answer by inviting him into a covenant relationship with himself. An unbreakable covenant relationship when God binds himself and his life to his words and his promises that he's giving to Abraham the same covenant that starts here in, in in Genesis 15 is the covenant God still has with the Jewish people group today it's an everlasting covenant and it all begins here with God's faithfulness and you might think then well that's great that's awesome but hey I'm not a Jew so how will that help me if this is a covenant God made with a Jewish people group? I'm glad you're asking because let's move on now to the New Testament, right? This is what Mark 14, 22 to 24 says. This is the night before Jesus gives his life. And it's a well-known story when Jesus is sharing bread and wine with his disciples. The introduction of what we know as communion. And it says this, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed and broke it and gave it to them, his disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant. So now we can study the old covenants in the, in, in the old covenant in the old testament, but Jesus is here introducing a new covenant. And how is he doing it? He's introducing a new covenant through this meal. Because one of the steps when you made a covenant with someone in the old testament was the meal. You broke bread, you ate together, you shared that cup. The food represented your life and you gave of yourself when you ate together and through that meal you gave of yourself into a covenant relationship and up to this point now in the bible this this had been that this point in jewish history had been the passover meal when the jews will look back and remember an annual reminder of god's faithfulness in his covenant with them but now Jesus says something else this is a new covenant it's my body and it's my blood it's a new covenant to understand what Jesus is doing here let me take you on a on a quick journey through the Bible now because the meal is important in the Bible when you study the food and meal, you will see it's always linked to a covenant. It's powerful, it's crucial, it's significant in God's, in the story of God's faithfulness. How faithful He is to His people. So when you start to think about it, if you read the Bible or if you heard a lot from the Bible, they eat a lot in the Bible. Right? They eat all the time. Like every story includes a meal. Like they, they love food like good old Texans, right? We love it. We're like, yeah, I will be in that story right away, right? That must be barbecue they are eating there. It's, it's a dry rub. I think so, right? But now when you study it, you see that Abraham, he eats with God in his tent and with angels. Jesus, he ate with people all the time. And the Pharisees, they were so upset. It's sometimes very interesting to actually study the details of what's going on. Because the Pharisees, they were not... They were not upset that Jesus was trying to reach out to the sinners or, or bless them or teach them or help them. But they were upset and they came to Jesus' disciples and they said, Your master, he's eating with the sinners. He's sharing food with them. Because that was intimate. That was something you would never do. That was a close connection. It had meaning to it. Even in the Hebrew word, which the, the Old Testament is written, the original language is written in, in the word for covenant in the Old Testament, when you study the root to that word, it actually means to sit down and eat together. 
So the meal has that significance when it comes to covenant. In my travels as a missionary, I've seen the importance of food in a lot of culture. I will not tell you everything because some food I, I wish I never had, right? But once when I went to Kenya, I was introduced to this, this belief system in a tribe in the, in the, in the, on the steps in Kenya. And if you were offended, if you were part of that tribe and someone offended you in that tribe, you could not forgive that offense until you sat down and ate goat stomach together. It's called manjasi in that tribe language. And they would sit down and cook. They will eat that. And as they were eating, in the act of eating, they brought forgiveness and reconciliation to the situation. When the food was done, they stood up again and the past was gone. They never talked about it again. Forgiveness was there, right? So even today in cultures we've seen and we find traces of this in our own culture here in America today. The biblical marriage which we believe in is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. When you give all you have into that relationship before God and promise that you will, you will live together, to live together and, and do everything and love one another until death sets you apart right and deep in all the deep hidden in all the wedding ceremonies is one amazing detail it's called the wedding cake I don't know if you heard of it before I make you hungry tonight I'm gonna preach about food all night you're gonna leave and all the restaurants in this area will be blessed right right but the wedding cake now today is a million dollar business because every wedding needs a cake. It's a significant part of, of most weddings. Why? But when, when you trace the roots back to it, the covenant between the man and between the woman, between the bride and the groom was not set. It was not set between the families until they had broken bread and eaten together. And after that, the celebrations could begin because now they were in a covenant they had eaten together and then through a passing of time it led up to us today and we are all excited when that wedding cake comes into that wedding right for different reasons of course oh my gosh I might need that I'm getting hangry over here right I need to eat that cake but also like we take pictures we lift up our little cousin to see oh they're cutting the cake and they're feeding and we look back and we realize why are we so excited again about this we don't really know but it's in our spiritual dna right it's there because it bears witness to the covenant all right so back to the bible do you remember the story about esau and jacob it's an amazing story esau he was the first born in the family of the twins and so he was the one that would inherit not just the earthly processions but also more important he will inherit the covenant blessings from god through grandpa abraham and then daddy isaac now it will be the first born esau but the bible says that esau he was spiritually immature even spiritually blind so he did not understand the significance of what God was doing or wanted to do Jacob his younger twin brother on the other hand he says that he was clever and crafty right and he understood spiritual law so one day I'm just retelling this story you can read it from Genesis chapter 25 to 27 so one day when Esau comes home he's hangry he's been out hunting right and he needs food and Jacob is there cooking right he's preparing a meal and, ja and Esau comes up and he says hey Jacob can I can I get some food I'm starving over here and you know what Jacob says sure sit down well I can give you some food if if I get the rights of the firstborn. 
And all of a sudden, this is not just family dinner anymore. But all of a sudden, this, with the condition attached to the meal, it turns into a covenant that is now spiritually and legally significant. Esau did not understand this. So he says, sure, right? And in his mind, he's thinking, well, nothing can change the fact that I popped out first for my mom's womb. But how could we ever change that? Sure, I give you that, right? So he had no clue what was going on. He did not understand the covenant aspect of what happens here, what is sealed with a meal and agreeing to the terms of eating the meal together with his brother. He could have been standing in front of the Supreme Court of America and it would have been as legally binding because he gave it away through a meal. Some people say that he sold it for a meal. That's not what it is. He made a covenant. He gave away legally a promise and he sealed it through this meal. Okay? There is power. Not in a meal per se, but in the covenant conditions that can be attached to the meal. The symbolic yet perfectly legally value me the meal represents. It's there. Now, you don't have to worry. If you made dinner plans, we're not a family. You don't have to worry. You don't have to go home and cancel and be like, oh my gosh, I would never invite anyone to food again in my life. I don't know what they will steal from me. No, that's not what it is. Don't worry. Keep eating together. Do you know? You can split that fry with someone on your way back home from church tonight. There is not a covenant value to it unless you agree to it, right? You see what I'm saying? So, so I, w I was in the church today trying to fix another problem with the camera. And, and, and Andy from the, the production dream team was here with me. And, and we worked for a couple of hours. And then I went and bought a Subway sandwich and I split it with him. That does not mean that we are blood brothers. Okay? It doesn't mean that he can grab my keys and run away with my car and say bye. No, no, no. I never agreed to that term. All right? I can't do that, right? So the meal is not witchcraft. It's not, it's not a spell, but it's about, it speaks in the Bible about the covenant promises God has given us. Jacob, he understood this. So now he continues his scheme, not just to get the right of the firstborn, but also to get the covenant blessing from God through Abraham, through Isaac, his father, and now to him. So when you read this story now, you see how Jacob, he, he dresses up like Esau in his clothes and with his cologne. And he walks into Isaac that is blind and he's touching him to make sure that it is Esau. And then Isaac say, I'm ready to give you the covenant blessing if you, what? Prepare me a meal. And then we eat together and then I can bless you. So again, the meal comes in there so Jacob does it he prepares a meal and Isaac blesses Jacob and spiritually and legally Jacob is now inheriting the the blessing and he becomes the lineage which through God will bless Israel and eventually give us Jesus if he would not have done this, we would today have been talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Esau right? Oh, we don't do that. He is known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Because of the power of the covenant through a meal, right? And in the New Testament in Hebrews 12, it actually says that even when Isaac understood that Jacob had tricked him and he had given the blessing to the wrong son, it says that he could not change what he had done you cannot change a covenant it's impossible a covenant is unbreakable a promise is a promise but now it's also sealed with a covenant that only death can change listen food and meals plays a major part in every part of 
the Bible. Abraham breaks bread and wine with Melchizedek in Genesis 14 as a foundation to the covenant in, in 15. In Exodus, when God delivers Israel from slavery in Egypt, he's, he's not just telling them that they need to take the, the blood from the Passover lamb and strike it on the doorposts, but they also have to eat the entire land. You must eat everything. Nothing can be left till the morning when Moses and the elders later renews the covenant they have with God when they're at Mount Sinai it says that Moses and the elders went up to the mountain they met with God and they heard from God and it says that they ate and drank okay when you read that you might think they're looking at it and ate some popcorn and they're enjoying the show no it's a covenant with God. David, after he may been made king, he's bringing the ark of the covenant back to Israel. And he's not celebrating, he's not just celebrating by dancing before the ark of the Lord. But it also said that he gave a, a cake of bread a, 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 to every adult in Israel. And he asked them to eat it in front of the tabernacle. It's a celebration, but it's also a covenant. And listen, in Genesis 3, the fall of man, the first original sin, when Adam and Eve bring sin into this world, it happens through what? Sharing a meal offered them by the devil with his conditions. And doing that, they're inviting the devil's lives, which is death, into their lives. And they are now bound as slaves to the devil and slaves to sin. The meal is powerful when it's connected to a covenant. And it points toward a covenant. And a covenant is unbreakable, an unbreakable relationship between God and us. With promises that never can be broken. So let's look and see what Jesus says now. We are getting ready soon to receive communion here tonight. And I want you to receive it as you never done before. Listen what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. This is such a famous scripture. Something we all been quoting before. When we are talking about Jesus to our friends that, that needs to know him. Right When we are sharing our faith with other people. It's a, it's a scripture we preachers love to preach. Right? It says this, here I am and I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in. And that's when we end it. But the verse did not end there. It actually continues with, I will come in and I will eat with that person. And they with me. Okay? <laughs> you rarely hear people quote the end to that scripture. Why? Well, maybe because we don't understand it. It doesn't make sense, right? Or maybe because it takes too long time sometimes to explain it. But listen, Jesus is knocking at the door to your heart and he's asking you to open the door. Why? So that he can come in. Why? Because he wants to eat with us. Well, that's weird. You never hear someone evangelize like that on 6th Street. You know, you need to open the door to your heart so that Jesus can come in and eat with you. Eat with me. No, it's not weird at all. It's amazing. Jesus is saying, I want to have a covenant relationship with you. That everything I have will belong to you. And you can know that you know that you know that I will never ever break my promises or change my word on you. He's telling us that it's deeper, that it's stronger, that it's more than just that initial encounter with him. He's got so much more for us. Jesus is saying in John chapter 6, 
51 listen to this I am the living bread that came down from heaven he's talking about bread it's a covenant symbol I am that bread he says if anyone eats of this bread he will live forever and the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh the bread is my flesh well is it flesh or is it bread yes the bread is my flesh he's talking about covenant relationship it's my bread it's my flesh I'm giving it to you I'm giving you my life he continues in verse 53 so Jesus said to them truly truly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus is saying it goes deeper. He's telling the crowd that is listening here in John 6 and he's telling you and I tonight. We can't stand with one foot in and one foot out. It's all or nothing. We can't just come to him and say, you know what, can you forgive me of my sin? And that's all I need and then it's fine and I hope I see you later. I'll come back if I need you later. Jesus is saying, you can't do that. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to be intimate with you. You need to share my bread. We need to have a covenant together. And if you do, you will have eternal life. At the end of this chapter, it actually says that the many or even most of the disciples, they turned around and left Jesus. They were not ready for that. They wanted the good benefits and they wanted to have a good time, but make a covenant with you, Jesus? I'm not ready for that. It's the first Wednesday of the month. And the first Wednesday of every month here at Reed Church, we partake of communion. We read the scripture about it. In the beginning of the now, let's just go back and read it again. This is the foundation of what we're going to do here in the next few minutes. Listen. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to them and he said, take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant. Church communion is not a religious, mysterious act. It's your covenant meal with Jesus. And it's not a renewal of the covenant he's got with you. It's not a renewal because I messed up and I need to renew it. No, no, no. It's a reminder of the unbreakable covenant that he made with you and with me on the cross. His blood was shed so that my blood didn't have to be. He paid for sin so I could go free. And through him and his forgiveness, I've been made righteous. You've been made righteous. That means we have a right standing today before God. Covenant. That everything God has belongs to me. He, all the promises He's been given to us. And today I can celebrate that as His son, as His daughter. It's a reminder. Communion is that reminder. It's also an act for us to get our hearts right before God. When we tell God, you honored your part of the covenant. Now I honor my part. We're doing that by telling him, God, all I have belongs to you. And when we say that, when we partake of communion, that's what we are saying. And as we are saying it, God is leaning down from heaven and he's whispering over your life. And all I have belongs to you. Romans 8, 31 and 32 says this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since He did not spare even His Son, 
but gave him up for us all won't he also give us everything else he did not spare his son I'm a proud father of a daughter and two sons and it's unbearable to think about having to give one of them up but God did and since he gave his son we can know since he gave the most precious thing he had we can know today that he will give us all things why would he hold anything else back from you he gave you his best second corinthians says this but as surely as God is faithful our message is not yes and no meaning sometimes yes sometimes no we don't really know no for the Son of God Jesus Christ who's been preached among you by us by me Silas Pastor Chris Lucas right Timothy was not yes and no but in him it has always been yes for no matter listen church no matter how many promises God has made they are yes in Christ and through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God sometimes we are too good to find exceptions sure I love that scripture Daniel but it's probably not for me or not at least right now yes yeah, sure I hear you but no tonight I want you to open your heart and receive receive all the goodness God has for you receive every promise that he's got for you he's for you he's not against you he's with you and if God is with you who can be against you he did not spare his one son but he gave him for us all how could he do anything but give us all with him do not we will receive in grace receiving faith just as we did salvation all God's promises all of them all God's promises all of them so let's grab that cup it's in the back in the seat in front of you or in the chair just grab that cup for a second and look at that cup his body is broken for you his blood is a new covenant between you and Jesus. Nothing is strong enough to hold this back from you. Tonight you will remind yourself of the cross and all your sins are gone. Let's close our eyes before we partake in communion. Let's have this moment with Jesus have this time with him right now when you close your eyes tonight your sin is gone you are the son the daughter of him and you can whisper to him tonight God all you have in Jesus belongs to me now the Bible warns us and I want every eye closed not to do this in an unworthy way I'm not talking about entitlement here that you're entitled to everything God has. No, it's not a magical spell. It's not a mystical force. It's a relationship with Him who gave you all. And every covenant is dual. Every covenant has two sides. So when we whisper, God, all you have is mine. You made all promise accessible for me. God will also tell you that what you have, Daniel, belongs to me. Covenant is dual. 
All you have belongs to God. Your finances belongs to Him. Your relationships belongs to Him. Your time belongs to Him. So tonight before we partake communion, let me ask you with this challenging question. What is He asking of you? What is He asking for you to give up or to give to Him? Not to be saved, not to earn more from His kingdom, but just to please Him as our Father, as, as He pleased us. His love for us is unmeasurable and now He's asking us to draw closer to Him, to experience more love. But sometimes we have to leave something behind. So maybe He's whispering to you right now. Maybe you never heard Him ask you, but He's asking you right now. He wants something from you. You know what it is? He wants your mistakes. He wants your sin. He wants your past. He's asking you not to hold on to it anymore. It's time to give it to Him. Maybe you've never given Him your sin. Maybe you never received that forgiveness, salvation. Maybe you've never, never given up your past or, or your mistakes. So maybe you've done that in the past, but you've been falling back to a lifestyle you're not proud of. Or you've been holding on. You thought you gave up your sin, but, but you were holding on to it. Now Jesus is ready to receive it right now. He's ready to take it from you. He's just waiting for you. He's asking you for it. And He's got a great exchange ready for you. As we give Him our sin, our mistakes, our past, our lives, He will give us what He's got in exchange. That is purpose. That is life. That is peace. That is purity. That is joy. That is meaning to your life. God has all of that lined up for you. But He wants to covenant relationship. So tonight, if you've never given Him your sin, before we partake of communion, before we do anything else, every eye closed, please. Because I want you to look to your heart. What can I give to God? What is it I've been holding on to? Sin, mistake, my past. It's time to give it to Him. I will count to three. And when I come to three, I want you to lift up your hand as a sign. That's me. I give it to God right now. And I want to pray with you right where you're sitting. No one else is looking around. It's just you and God right now. But it's time to make it right with God. So one, two, make it ready. Three, lift it up to Him. Lift it up. Give it up to Him right now. Keep that hand up. Give it to Him. Hands are up in the entire room everywhere. Give it to Him right now. Let it go. He receives it right now. Whatever that mistake that made you feel like a failure, whatever that sin is that's been pulling you down, whatever that, that past is that's been reminding you of, of, of your uselessness, now it's gone. Now Jesus takes it. Now it's crucified. It's nailed to that cross. And right now Jesus is pouring His love into your life. He's pouring His forgiveness into you right now. Put that hand on your heart and let's pray together. Let's say this, Jesus. I give you my sin. I give you my mistakes. I give you my past. Fill me with your forgiveness. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with purpose, life, peace, meaning, strength. Jesus, I have decided to follow you. No turning back. In the name of Jesus. Amen.